Welcome to Creative Block. We're your host, Gene. And V. We interview people in creative industries about their life, work, and hobbies while we doodle jam. We asked people on Twitter if they had specific topics they wanted, wanted us to discuss, take two, as well as some drawing prompts. And today with us, we have Rob Renzetti. Hey! Hi, Rob. Well, hello. I wasn't sure hey, when I was going, supposed Rob? to start speaking, but you made it very easy for me by addressing me directly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we try to we try to make it easy on our guests as much as possible. Please make it easy on me. I'm very delicate. <laughs> oh, we will. Uh, Rob, you have a ridiculously long and, as V put it, furnished career. Um, <laughs> still not, still so, not sure what that means, but okay. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, if your if your uh, house was your career, it would just have a lot of like interesting uh, and you know pieces, a lot of interesting. True. Some, True. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Thank you for translating. I, I, I get it. Yes, I, I understand. <laughs> Visms. Yeah, um, I've I've known you long enough now, V. Um, but uh, Rob, yes, tell us who you are and what you do. Oh, hi, I'm uh, Rob Renzetti, and um, <laughs> I do lots of different things. Um, I, I, I hesitate the word use the word famous because I don't think I'm famous, but I guess I suppose I'm most most uh, You're no well known. notoriously known for being the creator of My Life as a Teenage Robot, which was a Nickelodeon show in the early 2000s for people that aren't familiar with it. Um, uh, I have uh, worked on several other notable projects. I started my career at Hanna-Barbera uh, on a show called Two Stupid Dogs. I... Uh, Continued there and worked on my good friend Gendy Tartakovsky's show, Dexter's Lab. Uh, contributed to a little bit of, of Powerpuff, though I was away from that group when uh, that was happening because I was over Nickelodeon, creating my own show eventually. Um, I had a brief stint on Family Guy, uh, which was kind of crazy and out of character for me, but fun. Um, I've worked, uh, I was the story editor on my, Lauren Faust's version of My Little Pony, uh, Friendship is Magic. Uh, what else? Did I, work? I worked with uh, Alex Hirsch on Gravity Falls. I worked with the Houghton Brothers on Big City Greens. Uh, I'm working again with my good friend Craig McCracken, or just finished working with him on uh, the Netflix show Kid Cosmic. And I'm also mm -hmm. helping Alex Hirsch with his new adult animation project for Netflix, which has no title, has not been not been discussed publicly, and I can say nothing more about. Um, right. <laughs> I'm also I'm also I have a second career as a writer. Uh, I've done uh, four books with Disney Publishing. Uh, the most uh, popular of which was a, a, a actual book version of Journal Number Three from Gravity Falls, which I co-wrote mm -hmm. with Alex. Um, and I'm actually working on my first original um, book uh, currently for uh, Penguin Random House. Um, it's going to be a trilogy. Um, the first book is called The Horrible Bag of uh, Terrible Things. And it's a, it's a kind of a horror fantasy book where a, a, a middle grade uh, young man, uh, his sister gets kidnapped and taken into this bag and he discovers a whole world inside of it. And uh, so I'm writing that currently. So I'm, uh, that's, that's all. Amazing. Those are all some of the things I've done and am are doing. When you say that all front to back, that's like yeah. staggering. <laughs> that's, like, that's like the dream career. I'm staggered. I'm like, I, yeah. I just think it's really cool. I just love that like, you've created an IP, but you've also helped other creators like yeah. uh, run their IPs. It's just so cool. I kind of wanted to also ask you a little bit about um, going to going to college and what that was like for you, because I think that's really interesting. I read that you uh, studied art history. I did. Um, I originally went to uh, University of Illinois in downstate Illinois. I was born and raised in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, oh, me too. Where where are you from? I'm from uh, Addison. Are you from Schaumburg, Gene? Is that right? I am from Schaumburg. How do yeah, you know that? Yeah, yeah. How do you know that? I saw, well, I looked I looked you've, I looked you you've up. You've done your research. I researched yeah. you. I've been oh, stalking shit. you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. That's on, that's an honor, but uh that's uh yeah, I, it, a lot of people are from there. Like uh, there's it's a really concentrated area. Yeah, there's um you know, the, there's a you know, the Houghton brothers are Midwestern. Um, obviously, yes, Gendy yes. came from Chicago with me. We came out together. Uh, yeah, I've met Gendy. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, lots of people come from the Midwest and end up out here. Um, yeah, which is, definitely. you know, uh, fun. Um, and it is. Uh, but yeah, what was I saying? I was saying something and now I don't know what I was saying. About the uh, art history. In oh, yeah. The, so I, I, yeah. Went, I went to I went to uh, I went to school for art history. And um, I knew once I graduated with art history that I didn't want to do art history. Um, 
<laughs> a, little, a little context on timeline. I'm, I'm a very old man and I grew up in the, I was in high school in the 80s. So just in terms of um, the way things sunk up with the animation industry, um, I, uh, I started high school, I, I graduated high school in, in, um, in 85 and went to college from 85 to 89. And during that time, it looked like first that the animation industry was about to die um, that like Disney features wasn't even going to start, continue to make animation. And mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, I graduated in 89, 88, Roger Rabbit came out. Um, and there was this excitement about animation all of a sudden in this rebirth, because I'd wanted to be, I wanted to be an animator since I was a young kid. But by the time I got, mm -hmm. got to high school and, and college, I felt like, well, there's no career to be had there because things are dying. But right. before I was, before I graduated from University of Illinois, Roger Rag game, Rabbit came out. Uh, coincidentally, because mm -hmm. of all the, pop, the the popularity of that, there was this article in the Chicago Tribune about this school that Walt Disney had started, which wasn't accurate, but, you know, um, uh, called right. CalArts. And I'd known that there was this animation school in California, but I didn't really know what it was called. And there was really no way to find out that kind of information back then. There was no Internet. You know, there was no nothing sure. like no way to access information the way we have today. So. The cool, I was lucky that this article in the Tribune mentioned the name of the school. So I went back to uh, U of I after being home and seeing that article over um, over a break. And I went to the library and looked up the catalog for CalArts, like the catalog that they'd send out, the physical, like, want to come to CalArts? This is what you do, and found out about it. And weirdly, coincidentally as well, um, a person in my high school class had gone directly to CalArts out of high school. So hmm. he was oh, already wow. a CalArts veteran and he was someone I knew. We weren't super close friends, but we were we were like kind of in a, we were in the film club together in high school and all that. So I was home on a break. I, lo I looked him up. I went and saw him at his house, which he lived like five minutes away from me. I asked him, how do I get into CalArts? He gave me tips. Um, and so by the time I was, the, my last year at U of I, I basically got all my classes out of the way the first semester and spent the second semester making a student film, an animated film, like on my own. Um, because well, wow. he said, that's what will impress them if you have some animation in your portfolio. Sure. You know, if you have an animated film in your portfolio, that in figure drawing, that's what they're looking for. So like mm -hmm. I did, I figure drawed, which I'm always horrible at and still am to this day, but I did that. But I also did mm -hmm. an animated film on my own and, and sent that off to CalArts. Um, wow. And I will keep How rambling, so I don't know if that's a logical place to stop or not. <laughs> no, but I feel like that's like really interesting. Uh, like this is just me being uh, a little nerd, but like, how did you make your animated film at the time? Like, did you like take pictures? Because like you know, there wasn't flash or anything, right? No, there wasn't flash. It was all it was all pencil and paper. Um, it was the other. The, there's a couple of big influences in my life that got me started drawing, and I'll backtrack just for a brief moment. One was. I was super, super young. My mom had some drawing ability, a, a little bit, enough that she could, I could bring her like an image that I liked, like usually mm -hmm. out of a coloring book or something, and she could look at it and copy it. So I would ask her to copy these images and then I would color them and cut them out and use them as paper dolls when I was super, super young. And oh, I guess I, bo I, bothered, cool. I bothered her so much with that, that at some point she said, well, why don't you try drawing for yourself? And I don't know if that was just to encourage me or just to get rid of me, but yeah, get out of my. Get out of my <laughs> so I started drawing for myself, um, and I, you know, I never stopped throughout my whole childhood. You know, I would learn a whole craft just so mom can have some. Yeah, uh, have some free time. And the other, the other thing that was a huge influence on me was I had a cousin, um, my mom's sister's son. All my cousins are way older than me, so when I was like five, he would have been twenty years old or something like that. Um, but he was a huge Disney fanatic, not an artist, just loved Disney. He was like into Disney Anna. So he had the original, the art of Walt Disney book. He had like five or six, like art, like animation themed books from Disney. Like, and they would like, there'd be like a, Hey, the life and times of Mickey mouse or whatever it was called. And like, you'd open that up and there'd be images of like, here's a drawing from an animated film. This is how it's made. Like, so I learned the craft looking at these books that my cousin had. Um, and then eventually, um, um, the, the, um, the, uh, God, I'm blanking on the name of the fucking animation Bible that we had back then. Um, uh, survival, uh, is that the survival? No, Kids? no, not Richard Williams, but okay. the, uh, the, Oh, Preston Blair. No, no. Yeah. I had the Preston Blairs too, but, um, the illusion of life, 
you lose oh, your blood. That's oh, that's okay. that. Yeah, yeah, the, the so, Walt Disney one. Yes, yeah, yeah. by yeah, yeah. Um, by the um, you know, the two of the nine old men. So I um, I had that. I got that when I was in, I think, in high school or whatever. So that was my that was my instruction book. I looked to that. I see. Um, so I looked at that. I figured out how I should kind of do these things. You know, all the principles of animation were explained in there. Um, and then I just made my own. I made my own pegboard. Like I um. I, 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 I got a bunch of, I got a bunch of paper. I used a three hole punch, not an animation punch, but like a three, a normal three hole punch, like yeah. three round yeah, holes. Yeah, yeah. I, I punched a bunch of paper. I had a wood block. I, I, um, I, I draw, I, you know, I, I carved where the holes would come out. So I get the spacing correct. Then I took it to my like local hardware store, had them drill holes for me and get dowels, plastic dowels that matched that width, glued them into the board. And then I had my animation Damn. board, so I didn't have any light box. It was oh, just wow. it was just a board with pegs and type and like uh, like cheap paper that was kind of semi transparent, um, so I could maybe see down one level without a light shining through. Uh, and I just animated a film on that, and I just referred back to, um, you know, the the illusion of life, and like there was like three or four like chapters in that were that were hardcore on the animation principles. I just read those and, and did my first animated film. And my, my roommate at the time was a, was a film major. He had a Super 8 camera. So I just filmed it on Super 8. And oh, it turned cool. out like crap. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the animation was okay. I was waiting for the, for the reveal. I was like, is <laughs> the this, animation, does this all work? The animation was okay. Uh, <laughs> but the filming was very janky. <laughs> like, it was like, yeah. you know, it wasn't like the camera was not locked down in any substantial way. It was just like angled at the paper on a tripod. <laughs> right. Regardless, I had it. I sent it off to KelArts and I did not get in. <laughs> I did not get in that first time. But that was kind of how what I did my senior year. I basically didn't take classes the second half of the year. I'd taken all the I'd like gotten ahead enough that I like didn't really need to be in class the second half of the year. And that was my classroom was just learning how to animate on my own in my apartment. That's, that's really awesome. that's a really cool story. I, yeah. Yeah, I love stories like that because I love when um, people talk about like how hard they had to hustle just to do the thing that they wanted to do. Yeah. Because I feel like there's so many resources now, and and I, yet I still see people complaining about like they they you know it's like too hard, and it's like no, it's really not. <laughs> like like you have so much more than people in generations past had available to them, and so like if you're a creative person, you have like infinite possibility like there's nothing holding you back and so i i think it's important to hear for anybody that's younger it's like like what rob had to do is to just to like make an animated thing like that's so much work yeah it was um it was but it didn't seem like it didn't seem like a lot of work at the time because i was young that's and I, that's a good yeah you know, i had the passion for it and yeah. i it's what i wanted to do and i was willing to do mm -hmm. whatever i needed to do to um to get there. And that sounds like Horatio Alger shit and all that. And I don't necessarily believe all that. You know, there are, there are certain people that have more opportunities than that. I was, you know, I was, I'm, my parents, my dad was willing to keep paying for me to go to school. I had just graduated from four year, four year college with a degree. And my first thing was like, I'm going to continue going to school. <laughs> and not only that, but I want to go to this super expensive cool out school out in California. So, you know, get ready to pay for that. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, he was, he was, he, but my, you know, he was a little bit skeptical, but my mom was like, no, if that's what he wants to do, that's what we're going to, we're going to help him. We're going to, you know, we're going to do it for him. So, that's awesome. Um, you know, it was great, but it was like, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it's a privilege that not a lot of people have, but yeah, technically on a technical level, um, I mean, it's so, it's so easy to, um, so much easier to learn about animation and do all that, you know, to the point where I would say to some People, I don't know that it's you know worth paying the money to go to CalArts anymore. You know, I don't, I don't, mm. I just don't know if it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like yeah. A, a a discussion that comes back on Twitter every like year around like uh, summertime, I guess, like around yeah. graduation time. Because, and I and that's that's something that I, I mean, we've we've talked about it with like previous guests as well that it's totally possible now to be self taught and like make it in the industry. It's a lot of work, but it's 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 possible. It is possible. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have to follow that route, so I wouldn't know, yeah. um, you know, but I think it's just a matter of like um, the same sort of like um, desire to do it that um, I had back then. 
I mean, yeah, I, think, sure. I think if you're, I'm not going to want to talk about destiny and all that, because again, I don't know if I believe in destiny, but if you've got like this desire to be in the, in, in the industry, you know, you'll find a way to get there, you know, to definitely to, mm-hmm. to learn, to learn that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, uh, I can't imagine like all the, just like the ability, the access to, to knowledge online. I mean, it's a little hard to know where to start. Right. But like, you know, there's, yeah. you don't know what yeah. you're, uh, getting a reliable teacher or not necessarily, but, uh, do you yeah. feel like, um, going to Cal arts, um, helped you or help your, your career, like both in, um, well, like learning the, the craft, but also just like meeting all the people there. Oh yeah. I mean, that was key for me. Um, you know, uh, I've heard, you know, I've heard on your, the versions of your broadcast that, you know, your broadcast podcast, uh, <laughs> I love being a broadcast. You should be a broadcast. Sounds, yeah, that makes it sound fancy. I like that. <laughs> old old world, old words die hard. But um, mm. on the pack, podcast, you know, people talking about like, yeah, I was the I was the artist kid in my school, and I was surrounded by artist kids, and that was the case mm. for me too. And I was one of the worst artist kids there. You know, that became very <laughs> clear to me that like, I was gonna, you know, I was going to have to work harder to. <laughs> produce something of value because my my innate level of talent was much lower than the people I was surrounded by. I mean, there were some, I was in, I was in a class with some amazing artists and, um, and, uh, but it was good. It gave me a kick in the pants and made me, and made me work hard. Yes. But I mean, yeah. those connections, those connections were key for me, you know, and that I thought it would be the teachers that would be the key connections. And it really was the people around me. You know, I already mentioned Gendy. Gendy and I were, sure. were friends. We came out to Cal Arts together and were roommates and, um, you know, Craig McCracken was in our same class and, um, uh, you know, Lou Romano, who is a, a, a somewhat well-known uh, Pixar artist, uh, was there in our class as well. Sergio Pablos, who, you know, has his own animation studio now in, in Spain, was in our class. You know, he's the guy who uh, created and directed Klaus, the, lady, the recent mm-hmm. Netflix film. So, I mean, and there was just tons of other people of super, super talent, you know, that aren't necessarily names now because they kind of disappeared into feature animation and are, but are just like, you know, fantastic animators. We had a, we had a huge class and it was very talented. Um, and, um, you know, it was, uh, so it was very inspirational and intimidating to be around all those people, but, um, it was, it was great. I, I loved, I loved, I loved it. Um, and it was, you know, and, and kind of, I'd gotten my college experience out of the way. Um, you know, and meaning that like, I didn't need to party, not that I didn't sometimes, but I didn't need to party every weekend. I didn't, you know, I wasn't looking to hook up with anybody. Um, mostly because I realized at that point I was very, very, very bad with women. And I was, you know, <laughs> pursuing that was going to just take too much time away from what I was there to do, which was learn how to animate and try and get connected in a way that I could make a career out of it. So I you know, tried to ignore most of the dancers and, you know, just, you know, uh, hurry past the dance studio on the way to the animation uh, animation area <laughs> and uh, you know not get too distracted by all that kind of normal college nonsense because I'd already done you know four 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 or five years of that um, and didn't really need to do any of that anymore but that's the interesting time yeah. yeah well it's it's similar to when people do their like gen eds too you know like they go to a, a college which is a smart thing to do I think especially as as it gets more and more expensive where people will go to get like, you know, associate's degree, get all the gen eds, and then they'll do like an art school and just do all of the like art classes and hone in on that. I mean, that sounds kind of similar. Yeah, it was. And then, yeah, again, I, it's funny because I didn't get a degree from Cal Arts. I didn't go there for, I'd never intended to get a degree. I already had my degree in art history. And at the time I went to Cal Arts, um, I was there from 90 to 92. Um, like people were just getting was crazy the number like there was such a hunger for bodies like mm-hmm. uh, there was a point where um was it, i think it was the start of our second year like uh the simpsons had switched from uh classy shupo to film roaming and film roaming came in and like basically took like 20 people out of my class they just disappeared they went to wow. work at the simpsons never came back Damn. Um, yeah. Um, so like the idea that you'd stay there for four years, um, was just like, no, you're going to go there for some people went there for six months. Some people went there for a year. Two years was not, was the norm. Most people went there for two years and then tried to try to get hired. And that's what I did. And that's what Gendy and Craig, all of us, we all did that. Um, so we all came out of CalArts at the same time as well, but that was kind of the standard. So I wasn't there for a degree. So I didn't take any, anything but animation classes. Um, cause I didn't, I wasn't looking to get a college, college diploma. I already had one. 
Um, right, right. So yeah, th and that way it was just like very concentrated, like learn about learn about how to animate. Um, that was what the experience was about for me. What was your first uh, gig? Uh, your very first one, the one that you left CalArts for. Uh, the first gig I was to go overseas uh, to go to Madrid, oh. Spain, to be an animator uh, on Batman the Animated Series. Um, wow! So Sergio Pablos, the guy that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. he was from Madrid, and um, when he went away after our first year, he worked in the studio in Madrid as an animator for his like summer break. So second year when he came back, he said the studio I worked at is going to get like five episodes of Batman to animate and they want American animators. They want American animators who, you know, possibly understand the story a little bit better because they speak English. Um, and most, right. mostly also because they just need, they need animators. So five of us went over there. Um, so after my second year, that was my first gig. I had two gigs to choose from. I could have chosen to be basically a trainee slash assistant on uh, page master the movie from Turner mm -hmm, feature mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, with yeah, Macaulay that, yeah. Culkin and Whoopi Goldberg is an animated book. Uh, and, uh, and I had that choice to be like a lowly, lowly assistant or um, go to um, Spain and be an animator um, on Batman. And I chose, I chose that. So I was in, I left California and, and went to Madrid and, um, and spent about two and a half, three months there. Um, and it was horrible. It was a horrible experience. Oh, really? <laughs> what, was, what was like uh, the hardest part for you? The hardest part was trying to animate those uh, horrible, horrible, realistic superhero <laughs> characters. <laughs> that was not my style yeah. of drawing. Um, you know, I ended up doing a super sh superhero show, but like it's a very cartoony superhero show. Like I, mm -hmm. my, I grew up on like uh, my favorite artist was Karl Barks. I loved Uncle Scrooge comics. I still do. Um, you know, I'm I'm buying all the reprints now as we speak um, uh, that they've mm -hmm. been putting out from Pan and Fan Graphics. But um, uh, I do just I read cartoony stuff. I only discovered superhero comics really when um, I was in college, um, when um, when Frank Miller did, um, you know, the Dark Knight series and all that. That's what brought me to superhero comics. But I didn't draw that way. I didn't draw that way at all. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a real challenge to draw that stuff. And also it was just like it was a bad it was a bad job scene, like unbeknownst to us when we went over there the company was on its last legs financially. Like, oh. I don't know, what, I don't know if somebody had embezzled something or whatever, but like um, I left earlier than the other um, English um, animators, but through them, I heard like the company went bankrupt and people didn't get their money. Like they, like oh when we were there, like we were promised, like we're, you're gonna get this X amount. I don't even remember what it was. It might've been like $800 a week, but that sounds too high right now. Like maybe it was $500 a week, whatever. But they're gonna give us up. They were gonna give us, a, get us an apartment and give us X number of dollars a, a week. And that was it, they were gonna set us up. Well, we lived in a hotel for like two months. And I mean like Yikes. four of us in one room in a hotel <laughs> for like the first couple months we were there. And every time we asked for our weekly salary, they'd ask, well, how much do you need? Like they oh, wanted man, to know like yeah. how much we oh, needed just to survive. <gasps> So, so shady. We were getting so we were getting not what we were supposed to be being paid, and we were in this hotel room. And eventually, they found us an apartment. And we were in an apartment. Um, and the only reason I left earlier than everybody else was, well, one, I was doing doing horribly, and and and, and realized it. But um, but um, you know, also my my dad got sick. He had like a we thought it was a heart attack at the time. It wasn't a heart attack, but like my dad was sick, and I was like, I'm having a horrible time here. I'm going to my dad's sick. Um, so I told them I got to leave and I need my money and they paid me yeah. off. They paid me off and gave me everything I was owed because they were trying, they didn't want me to be like saying like I was, I was leaving without all the money that I was owed. Um, mm -hmm. right. Um, but after me, like the, the Spanish, like there were some Spanish animators there, like, you know, this was not, not, I won't say it was a lark. It was meant to be our start of our career, but like we were Americans basically on like kind of a fun let's go animate in, in Europe adventure. But these people, this was their li livelihood. They had families, yeah. you know what I mean? Like there were Spanish animators who hadn't gotten paid for like a year. Like they were given the Spanish animators that same routine where they'd be like, how much do you need this week? Um, Unfortunately, yeah, that's kind of, I wouldn't say common, but it's not the first time I hear stories like that yeah, in Europe. Um, yeah, it's like, I think it's just because the studios are always like, a lot of the studios there are like on the brink of uh, bankruptcy, yeah. Um, yeah, it's yeah. A, it certainly um, 
it certainly seemed like it um that mm. something weird was going on but we were unaware of it you know we didn't we didn't yeah know. we didn't yeah, know. yeah yeah that's crazy that's that you got lucky though like you could i did get lucky go back. and uh going back to the u.s then uh did you kind of like wait a little bit before you started working again because of like all the all of what was going on with your family or were you yeah i mean i came i came home i I licked my wounds back in chicago for a couple of months Mm -hmm. uh knew once i knew my dad was okay um i was kind of anxious to get back out to california because that's where all the jobs were Mm -hmm. um and um so i did i i um i came back out and um actually crashed with a friend of mine um uh randy myers who was in another uh friend from my classic hell arts he had actually gotten a um he got in a uh, apartment in in uh, in Valencia near the school, uh, mm-hmm, which a lot mm-hmm. of people a lot of people did, and um, and he was working at PageMaster. He was working at the job that that I turned down, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, I was uh, you know he was letting me crash on my couch. Gandhi was actually crashing on his couch at the same time. So um, there's so many people crashing on couches had, in this he era. Had a, he had a big couch. He had a big couch. Um, <laughs> Just a pile of animators on one. Couch. But yeah, I was kind of like just bumping around looking for any kind of lead. Um, I had I had an interview at Pixar at that time, which was really strange because I went up the I went up north and talked to them for an afternoon, but then there was like no offer of employment or anything. It was just kind of like I actually traveled up to Northern California to just have a conversation with these people, and then oh. like nothing after that. And um, but you know, after I think it was probably a couple of months. Um, this is where the connections that I made at CalArts really paid off because um, uh, there was a CalArts grad, Donovan Cook, who had gotten a show picked up at Hanna-Barbera called Two Stupid Dogs. And he hired his friend from CalArts, Paul Rudish, to be an art director on the show. And Paul, and there were gonna be two segments. There were gonna be the dog segments and this revival of um, uh, Secret Squirrel. So Paul yeah, was gonna yep. art direct Secret Squirrel. They need somebody art direct uh, two stupid dogs that Craig ended up getting that job because he knew Paul. And then they West Craig, we're looking for storyboard artists. And Craig said, I have two friends, Robin Gendy, who would be great storyboard artists. So we came in and, and showed them our portfolios and we all got hired. So it was like this kind of, um, you know, very incestuous train of references <laughs> all the way down the line where we all just kind of got hired on the show together based on each other's recommendations. <laughs> And uh, and that's where we started on it was Paul and me and and um, uh, Craig and Gendy and also um, uh, Mike Moon who has, who's like became a big exec at Disney and is an exec at Netflix yeah. Adult Animation now he was a background artist on the show we were all together working on the show. That's um, crazy! I didn't know Mike was uh, an artist originally. I've o- always uh, known him as an exec. Yeah, he was. That's an, really- <laughs> he was. A, he was mostly a background artist. Yeah, and uh, and then he went. He went from Hanna-Barbera to Disney, and then he kind of made that transition when he was at Disney. That is so cool. That's interesting. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, uh, it was, uh, it was I wanted fun. to ask, like, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. That's all I was going to say. I, I uh, yeah, I'm like fascinated by. Um, sort of the differences in the industry from uh, from back then to now. And uh, and I, I always ask, like, I, I ask our guests that have been around for, you know, a couple of decades, like, uh, what are the biggest changes you've seen happen? And, um, like, what, what has stayed the same and what has been the biggest change from when you first got into now? I mean, the th- first thing that occurs to me is the the the, the number of women that are in the industry. Um, oh, okay, that's good. Uh, yeah. uh, there were like really no women artists when I started. Um, every um, mm-hmm. everybody was um, everybody that was um, not a man was in the production side of things. Um, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's very exciting to see so many women artists out there, and um, not any, mm-hmm. only out there, but starting to get the chance to. Um, to uh, you know, do their own thing, do their own shows, yeah, show be, run, yeah. be in be in you know management positions, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know that's that's I mean, and of course technology and, and the change that that's that's raw. But you know, the, for all the talk of that, you know, it doesn't really change the basic the basic building blocks of the of the of of the industry. You know, we, even if we're drawing digitally. Which I seemingly can't seem to do on this Google board. It won't let me draw, um, but uh, I'm trying. I'm trying my best. Uh, We're drawing uh, so many Jennies. Don't I know. Worry. I see them. They're, they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, and we tackled Wakeman too. Congratulations on tackling 
the hardest character I've ever had to draw in my life. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, the technology is just kind of, it's, you know, you're still doing the same, the same parts of the job, the storytelling aspects, the, the, the parts of the production are all kind of the same where they're just done digitally instead of on paper. Um, and, uh, God, I wish we'd had this technology when I was doing my show, I could just create a template of Jenny's head shape and, and be done with it. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, the, 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 the composition of the, of the, of the industry has really changed quite a bit. Um, you know, and, 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 um, and people of color and, and, you know, LG, uh, LGBTQ people, you know, coming to the forefront. Um, that's all, a, that's all a big shift. And, um, um, you know, it's great. Um, you know, um, I'm not one of those people that thinks like, oh, now nobody wants to see anything from straight white men anymore because that's just a ridiculous statement. You know what I mean? Like it's right. yeah. people, people of my gender and my skin color still have so many opportunities compared to everybody else. It's, you know, I, I, I'm excited to see people come in and have different perspectives mm-hmm. and, and get their chance and get their chance to create and um, bring all that to the table. So to me, that seems like it's the biggest change um, you know, networks, mm-hmm. networks come and go, uh, studios rise and fall and rise again. Um, the consistency that you have, at least what I've found going through is the people, the people that you work with, the crews that you work with, you know, just the fact that I've, I've, you know, Craig and I started out in school together. We worked on Dexter together. You know, I came back to Cartoon Network and we worked together again there on Fosters and, 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 and did the Cartoon Institute. Um, we, you know, did a series of shorts there together and then, you know, went our separate ways, but then we were like working together next to each other at, you know, at Disney while I was working on Gravity Falls, he was doing Wander Over Yonder. And then like, all of a sudden now we're working together again to create Kid Cosmic. Like, you know, that, that relationship has been real important to me on personal and professional level. Um, but that's just cause we, you know, we get along so well and we know each other's stuff and we like working together. Um, but like, yeah. you know, we've done that at three different studios, like, you know, uh, four different studios, if you want to say Hanna-Barbera and Cartoon Network were two different things, um, mm. you know, so I, I, there's lots of good execs out there um, and I have good relationships with them. But like, you know, it's the it's the other artists in the industry and the creative people that you work with that really make the difference. And that's the that's that's what hasn't changed. That's the kind of the creative through line for me is just the people that I work with and, and work with repeatedly and come back to you. Do you feel like talking about change, do you feel like now would be, uh, do you think it would be possible to create something like Cartoon Institute again? Or do you feel like that was something that was like very specific to its time? I mean, I think the, I mean, there's always these pilot programs going on. Gene, I mean, they're trying. You, yeah, you, 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 yeah, you, right now. You suffered. Yeah. You, you suffered through <laughs> one, right? <laughs> I <laughs> sure did. One. Well, no, I was gonna. Yeah, not not to deviate from what you're gonna say, but yeah, like you know, Nick tried and keeps trying, and they. I don't know what the point is because they don't green light anything. But um, but I mean, CN's doing uh doing it right now. They they brought back cartoon cartoons, so it's like yeah. Mm. yeah I mean, so it's, it's kind of it's you know that's how Gendy got his show. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, that's how I got my show. That's how Craig got his show. Um, it's really the best testing ground for, yeah, for an idea. You know what I mean? And it's, it, it was short. It yeah. makes a lot of sense. And you got to credit Fred Seibert with that. He's the first one yeah, Fred. that mm-hmm. came up with it. And when we did the cartoon Institute, we were just like, we're just going to do what Fred did. You know what I mean? Except we, <laughs> except we actually, we actually we actually paid people for their boards before they got greenlit. <laughs> we, like if you come and verbally pitch, what? yeah, if you come and verbally pitch to us, we'll we'll give you money to go do a board. Uh, we didn't have that went back in Fred's day. What but, a time. Um, you know we, uh, but uh, you know besides that, it was the same. It's the same thing. It's just like mm-hmm. you know, people. Fred had a great eye for talent, and you know if if you're creative, you recognize that creative spark in other people. Hopefully. And, you know, if people come into you and say, I've got an idea uh, and they and they talk to you about it and you can, you know, you can start to see it, you know, like, yeah, there's something here, but like, I can see it, but show me what you see, you know, go off and do it. We have faith in you. You know, we're going to at least give you the chance to do a board and, and, you know, and we'll see how you do at that phase. And if we like it, you'll go forward. And if it doesn't live up to our expectations then you know, um, no hard feelings and we, you know, we gave you your chance. And Mm -hmm. to me, that's there's everything else is just a variation on a theme there's really no better way to do it you know and you can do shorter stuff like for three minutes that that seems uh you know it seems a little bit 
tight to get something good in that though you've done it gene and others have done it i know but it's like uh it's just you know i like i like the seven minute format for for pilots even 11 minutes are good yeah. you know um but I, mm, I seven minutes is good yeah there's no other seems like there's no other way to really it's the best way to prove prove the um the viability of something um do you feel like uh, do you feel like running something like Art Institute kind of like helped you later on when you were helping uh, New York creators at Disney run their show? Um, yeah, I mean, sure. It's um, it's a bit of a trick to what you what you learn and what I learned was, and I, I mean, I wasn't, I don't think I was trying to do this, which is like, as a creative person, when you're in a collaborative medium like animation is, you want to offer up ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes the best thing you can do is not offer up ideas, but just offer up constructive criticism, <laughs> meaning mm -hmm. like I have enough faith in you that you're going to solve the problem I see in a way that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can solve it. I can I can look and see what I see, is, what I think is a problem and say, mm -hmm. well, this is how I would solve it. But that's not always the most useful thing to do, which is like uh, offer up that offer up that you know offer up the solution you know like mm. that's what fred always did fred always was like uh here's i like here's what i like here's what i don't think is working um you know uh come back to me in a couple weeks and show it to me again um yeah. mm -hmm. you know um and you know and then if even if he didn't agree with your solution if you solved what his problem was and you know it wouldn't be necessarily his cup of tea but he's like it makes sense and i see it i see your vision so yeah let's go with it yeah um mm. because you know we yeah. we're working with people you know that were really the ones that go forward have a really strong they have a strong vision and um you don't need to you don't need to solve the problem for them so mm -hmm. you know uh working with alex and then working with the houghton brothers like it's not that i didn't contribute creatively because they ended up doing that but like I like to um I use like to use the analogy that I like um I like to like um this this sounds horrible but it's like I'm like the water and the frog in the water analogy like I I st I start I start very low temperature like I'm very not passive but like I'm not going to I'm not going to give you the full force of my personality when we first start working together I'm going to let you get a sure, sure. acclimated to me and then I'll slowly turn up the temperature so you'll never know that you're boiling in a rob soup until it's too late <laughs> Billy and Rob soup. What a, oh what man, a statement. I really yeah. Now I'm like curious what that looks like. <laughs> and all, all, the, all that means is like you know because you're, you know, um, the, the, when I when I hooked up with Hersh at Disney, like Disney yeah. had this reputation for basically bringing people that didn't know how to make cartoons in as creators and then getting some industry veteran to basically run the show for them. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't interested in that. I'm like, if I'm going to run a show, I'm going to run a show with my own idea um, mm -hmm. so yeah. that I get the credit for it. Um, but I'm also not interested in teaching something, someone something and then them getting all the glory while I do all the work, um, mm -hmm. as little glory as there is. But, mm -hmm. I, you know, we had this, like, they did this, like, meet and greet lunch with me and Alex, and we'd actually seen, met each other and been in a room a, a couple times before. But, like, I instantly knew, like, one, this guy knows what he's doing. He knows what he wants to do with his own show. Mm -hmm. And I will just be helping him do that. And I can bring my creative energy to it. But he knows what he wants to do. He knows what he wants to do with this project. And I'm just going to be another creative force in the room. And I will not come in first day and start trying to boss people around or impose my will or anything like that. Like that's the that's where the that's where the water is, you know, tepid. Like I just come in, get used to it. Like people get used to me you know, joke mm -hmm. around and everything like that. But by the time, you know, six months later, if I've proved myself and we're a good fit, then I'm a reliable collaborator. And I can speak them and say like, no, Alex, I think what you're doing right now is wrong. Like, I think that's a bad decision or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But like, mm -hmm. I think you have to be careful when you're in that kind of collaborative uh, right. relationship with someone who's, this is their baby. Like you have to be, mm -hmm. as, it's like you wouldn't run up to a new mother and say, Oh, that's a great looking baby. Let me hold it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, I think like, some people do. That, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, well, they shouldn't. Um, but you know, it's like yeah. it's like you know, admire the baby for a few minutes before you ask to hold it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, you know, change its diaper or whatever the analogy is. You know what I mean? Like, be be careful with these people's creation. It's such a great thing that you're talking about because it's something that we haven't really 
talked about at all on the podcast. And it's something that I don't see being talked about uh, that much, you know, because uh, what you're saying about Disney having this model of like new creator and experienced showrunner, I've heard of that, but I've always wondered kind of like how that worked. And it's really great to have your insight on that. And yeah, I mean, it, it really is a matter of, it's a matter of just like personalities and if they get along, but um Mm -hmm. you know sometimes you don't have the option like you're just the person is forced on you and that could be that can be bad i mean there's been horror stories i've heard of but um, you know uh you just you got to know your role like if i wanted to do another show of my own i would have pushed to do that you know what i mean like i right after i was done with teenage robot i just didn't i didn't have that i didn't have that desire um to do it again um so i haven't you know what i mean like mm -hmm. but i but i but i but the thing that I, the thing that was the most fun about working on your own show is the high level collaborative creative work you get to do which is you know coming up with ideas coming up with new characters coming up with storylines you know the the you know um the 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 art direction of it the look of it helping to create that all that kind of high level stuff and when you're when you're like a second in command which i've been several times you get to have your input on all that stuff the difference is it's like at the end of the day one thing doesn't something doesn't work it's like on craig's shoulders or alex's shoulders like all right well you're the show creator go fix it uh, you know i'm gonna have i'm gonna have i'm gonna go have dinner you know what i mean like not that i haven't worked i've worked plenty of late nights with with all the other show creators i've worked with but you know like it's not on me at the end of the day it's on you man it's your show you know so sure, yeah, a, yeah. it's a little yeah. it's much easier to be number two um and I know that better now, having been number one. Like number two is a much mm -hmm. easier position to be in. It's it's it's, it's challenging. It's not easy, mm -hmm. but it's easier. It's a lot easier. Yeah, but, co captain. Yeah, that's like a really that's a really great perspective. Um, I love that. That's really interesting. I was gonna ask something else. I was go oh yeah, like I was gonna ask like if that's okay to ask like kind of like in the nitty gritty of things um when you're second in command like you said that you're helping with like creative ideas and everything do yeah. you also help with things that are more technical like for example i don't know like character count or like backgrounds or like kind of like the more uh production uh heavy lifting type of things this is something that you uh also give your input on and what which part do you feel is the most important in your job, like the the technical aspect or the creative creative aspect. I mean, I think creative is the most important, but I mean, I I have the ability to do the technical uh, stuff because um, uh, you know I've done a little bit of everything. So I mean, I when I'm working on a show, I'm usually I'm I'm in the editorial sessions. I'm in um, I, I I you know ne not necessarily review backgrounds though. I've I've done that. Um, you know. Mm -hmm. Um. Um. You know my 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 um my workload in my areas of um concentration kind of um vary from show to show um so you know like on um on gravity falls i wasn't really involved in the um, art stuff at all one we had mm. a we have an amazing art director uh ian worrell who was fantastic and um you know mm -hmm. hirsch would do all the art reviews and i wasn't really involved in that but i was in every i was in every story session um, I was in every automatic session. I was in every, at every mix. I was in at every edit. Um, and I was the one who supervised the timing of the show. In other words, I would, cause that was, that was traditionally hand-drawn. Um, mm -hmm. and it was, um, you know, I had to look at the X sheets for every episode of that show. Um, I reviewed them to make sure it was what Alex wanted. And I knew what Alex wanted because I'd been in every, um, every, uh, every story meeting with him and every script review and all that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't write any scripts, but I, you know, I was in the high level conversations and helped come up with the, the continu mm. continuity and, and, and the lore of the show, um, you know, which Alex walked into the room with a large portion of, but he didn't have all of it. Um, so a lot of that stuff we figured out um, together with the writers. Um, That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Now on the, on the Houghton's show, um, I would do, we would do, uh, we did board reviews that, you know, Gravity Falls was script driven, uh, Big Sea Greens was um, board driven. So they'd have, there would be very, very detailed outlines, but a lot of it was created in the storyboard. So we'd be in storyboard sessions for three, four hours and I'd be sketching and coming up with gags and doing that kind of thing. So, you know, that wasn't something that I did 
as much in Gravity Falls because it was script driven, but like on the Houghton show, it did a lot of that. And also, again, I reviewed, I reviewed the act sheets because it was traditionally, um, traditionally uh, animated. Um, and but again, I was in the story meetings. I'd be in the edits. I'd go to all the mixes. Did all the kind of post stuff. I was, mm. you know, one of the people um, offering my opinion on that stuff. That's really cool. I love to hear about that because I, I, you know, it's it's always um, every show is different, and it's really interesting to hear like how the pipeline works and what the each different like roles actually entails. So um, this is like super interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something that we like to ask all of our guests is uh, how do they deal with creative block and what does it feel like for them. Um, I mean, I feel like I'm going to be sound like a jerk if I say I've never really had creative block. I feel like I have, um, but nothing that's to call it, you know, like it's not writer's block or anything that lasts super long. Um, I guess the closest equivalent I have is that whenever I'm about to start something new or about to finish it, I just don't want to do either one of those things. Right. Like if yeah. I, when I was a board artist, I never wanted to start my board and I'd never wanted to finish it. So there was always yeah. this. You know, deadlines can be very useful <laughs> when it comes to that. Like, you know, because people yeah, are, yeah. people are in industry, if you're being paid for a job, you don't really have the luxury of, you know, saying like, sorry, I couldn't come up with the ideas. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, you can't, I guess you can say that a couple of times before you get fired, but um, you know, otherwise you gotta, you gotta do something. Um, oh yeah. You're a professional. You gotta do the work. That's, and I mean, yeah, I think, I, mean, I think that helps it like helps this muscle where you're like, you yes. you learn to just come up with something on the fly and i think yeah. part of that part of creative block can sometimes come from like the, looking for the perfect idea yeah. as yes. opposed to yeah. like the serviceable idea or just like mm -hmm. just to get mm -hmm. something down on paper whether it's words or drawings and just have something to to then look at and say well that's not right but now i can i have something to go off of um you know and the other thing is you just take breaks, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, don't, you can't, sometimes you gotta just walk away from your screen and, and take a walk. I mean, um, you know, sometimes there's been things that, that I've, luckily I have enough experience now that like if I'm writing something and, and something's eluding me, I know like, well, it's eluding me for now. It, 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 the, the, solution will, the solution will either come or, or something needs to change. So give it some time and, and let it marinate in your subconscious and come back to it. And a lot of times I'll be like in the shower and be like, okay, I'm soaked up now. I, I guess it's I can't. It's always the shower. Yeah, I, yeah I was gonna say it's always a shower. It's always a shower, <laughs> right? We, we, yeah, we talked about it with somebody else. I forget who, but yeah, it's always Jason a shower. Jason DeMarco? I was, it was Jason DeMarco, yeah. yeah. It's always the shower. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I've been lucky in that like, uh, you know, um, I haven't had a huge problem with creative block throughout the years, but um, if I'm never able to something, if I can't just can't just figure something out, I just take a break and and, and come back to it. Um, you know. Well, yeah. It if sounds you, like you have a healthy relationship with it, which is yeah, which is good. And I think the stuff, the, the the tips you mentioned are really valid tips. And we've we've talked about it before. It's like when you're a working artist and you're a professional, you don't have time to wait for inspiration. And um, yeah, you just gotta work. And like, and and I'm glad you said that it's a muscle because we've also brought that up as, as well. It's like, it's a muscle you have to train. If you don't do it, if you don't, you know, if you don't exercise for a while, it's gonna be harder to lift that weight. Yeah. But if you're always lifting that weight, and then it's, it's it gets easier. I mean, it goes back to my time, my time at Cal Arts, which was that like, I didn't know it at the time, um, but they're like, the fact that I wasn't, I was near the bottom of my class and from my own self-analysis as ter in terms of talent was actually a blessing for me in that it made me realize I'm going to have to work harder than some of these people do. And like, yeah, I'm just going to have sure. to put in the hours and like, you know, uh, have that good Midwestern work ethic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, coming yeah. from Illinois, I was like, I can put my nose to the grindstone. I know how to do that. I have the discipline to spend hours, yeah. hours draw animating this scene that maybe, you know, Sergio like can animate it in five minutes or whatever. And it's going to be so much better, but like, all right, well, whatever. Like I'm only in competition against myself um, uh, for now, you know, like trying to get better, get better than you are. That's the goal. And like, just work, just work hard, you know? And there's some people like this used to drive, uh, Gendy crazy on um, Dexter, which was 
because Craig did many things, but Craig was, you know, he was the art director and, and he was, um, but he was also the, he was also a board artist and um, he would not do his boards. He would be given three, two, three weeks or something, three, four weeks. I forget what our schedule was like back then before he had to do his first pitch and he wouldn't do anything. Like, so let's say it was four weeks. He would do nothing for three and a half weeks. Like literally he would not draw a thing. Um, and, and Gendy was well aware of it because Craig would be in everybody else's room, like socializing all day. <laughs> and then he would go home, like either the night before the pitch or a couple nights before the pitch. And he would just stay up all night or stay up two nights in a row and do the whole board. And it was always That's crazy. And it was always brilliant. And, um, the thing was, is like Craig was saying, like, I am working. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I'm marinating. I'm thinking about it. I'm not mm-hmm. doing it yet. I'm doing it in my head. I'm thinking about it. And that drove Gendy crazy because like, much like me, Gendy was very much like put one foot in front of the other. Like you draw, mm-hmm. you like, yeah. mm-hmm. you get your panels, you, how many panels per day? Like how much, how much of this, you know, like how much of the script or how much of the outline did you get through? How much time do you have? Do the math, divide it up, do it regularly. Like I was very like, Gendy and I were both very much like the ants. You know, like you work steady yeah. and Craig was very mm-hmm. much the grasshopper, um, you know, except, you know, he doesn't die at the end. He comes, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's able to like pull it, pull it out of his butt at the end and do an amazing board because that's the way he works. Uh, you know? That's so funny. It's so true. I, this is literally uh, so true in terms of like personality types. I also have a friend who's a board artist who works exactly like Craig, like exactly, exactly the same thing, mm-hmm. exactly the same thing. He would just kind of like run around the studio like have a nerf gun i don't know just like do crazy stuff and do nothing and then the last day work until like pull up an all-nighter and then the boards were great and i'm more like your personality type where it's like look at the number of pages divide it up in the number of days yeah yeah, and then it's like do it like because i don't know it's like kind of like that safety uh rail that yeah. you're like yeah. all right like i know i'm on track and if it gets like too low compared to what you originally planned you're like all right gotta crank it up a notch and <laughs> but then you know you can deliver <laughs> yeah I, mean, I almost yeah i almost go the other way where i try to finish everything as fast as possible early and then give myself time to decompress so that i can do the same thing again it's like the exact opposite version of that no i see what you're saying like yeah, yeah. get your get your get your relaxation after the job is done i mean if ever yeah. if ever i can relax like that that is that is w- uh, when you do it it's interesting yeah. though because like yeah. after my um after teenage robot you know, like the the, when you have your own show, like there's never those rest times. There's always right, more. Do. There's <laughs> always work. there's always work piling up somewhere, and you're very right. painfully aware of it. So like, you get you get so hyper, um, and it's, it's so hard to relax. And like, even after my show was over, there was like a good six months where it was just like I was just in this kind of constant um, frenzied energy of like, there's got to be something that I'm not doing right now that needs to be done. Um, and yeah. you just, it takes a long time to come down from that. And it's, you know, it's one of the reasons I've never wanted to have a show again. It's like, I'm not sure I want to feel like that again. Um, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like and, you can't really like sit down and like read a book because you're like, oh, I should just be like doing something productive or something. Yeah. I mean, like, it, I should, that's, you know? that's when yeah. I learned, like, if you go to bed with a list of things in your head, you are not going to be able to fall asleep. Like just yeah. write out the list get the list written yeah. out and maybe you'll mm. be able to relax enough to <laughs> sleep because i'd be like i'd be like well what do i got to do tomorrow what's my day tomorrow yeah, look yeah. like and start right. thinking about it and like you know never get out of that headspace i've yeah, actually read that tip a lot that it's like definitely like keeping like a, a notebook by by the bed yeah. so that when you go to bed you can just actually all write it down and then you're like okay i'm not going to forget about that can sleep because it's written in this book right and exactly like, yeah yeah and, the, and, the, and and you and the opposite is true like i'll kick myself in the head if like i wake up in the middle of the night and like think of an idea for whatever i'm working on and be like oh yeah that's a good idea but it's so it's so obvious i know i'll remember it in the morning like no you never remember it and it's like <laughs> wake get out of your bed and write it down even in the most scribbly form because otherwise it may it most likely will be gone when yeah. you uh, when you think of it next time um so yeah it's a uh, yeah it's yeah i mean i always I'm very um, analog in that I always have pieces of paper with the fragments of ideas strewn about. Um, <laughs> I don't keep anything in a very, very organized journal or whatever. Like there's not going to be a Robert's library with all my old journals and all that. Cause like 
they're just on random pieces of paper that I throw away once I have the once I have the, uh, I, the idea put yeah. into put into the uh, the document or whatever I'm working on, then the, the note disappears. <laughs> yeah, I used to do that more. I I have I have a sketchbook that I consider almost uh, sacred in a way that yeah. other artists don't. Where it's like you know it's like it's almost like a diary in some way where it like captures a moment in time. Um, but I used to do that too. I had a little shitty memo book that I would just scribble in that was meant to be more disposable and I haven't done that. And I wonder if that's like affected me in some way that like, I don't have that disposable I do, energy anymore. Yeah. I do feel like this is definitely like a, like some sort of like discipline type um, endeavor to have. Like I, I used to have, I don't know. I kind of go in and out of it. And I feel like every time I do carry around my notebook and I write stuff down, I'm like, I'm so creative and I have all these things I can come back to yeah. whenever I just have like, a moment yeah but i know what you mean it's like it's like you know what though like uh <laughs> having a phone helps too i think i think I, I i do scribble a lot of notes you know like i i put stuff into my notes app so i guess it's just a digital version of that but it's not the same it's yeah there's some, yeah. there's something about like actually writing ideas mm -hmm. down that makes it feel more like tactile yeah. i don't know yeah uh, i mean I, i'll i'll do so many different versions that are like if i'm out i'll leave myself a message at home we still have a landline so like that's a that's a great external memory for like oh, everything like call on your cell phone mm -hmm. back to your landline or vice versa. <laughs> that's interesting. Like when yeah. when I had an office, I would call my cell phone and leave myself a voicemail with an idea. Idea, you know, it's like. Uh, but you normally these days, since I'm in the house most of the time, I just like reach for a scrap paper and write it down and like okay, I'll put that into the manuscript next time I'm working mm -hmm. on it. Um, yeah. Uh, you mentioned. Oh, go ahead, V. Yeah, I was just gonna ask about the book. Like, I wonder, like, kind of like, what do you feel like is the biggest difference going from uh, being a, a writer on the show? Because you you've been a writer, you've helped uh, uh, write other with other people's shows, and you've been like a story editor. Um, no, story had a story on My Little Pony, right? Yeah, well, story um, story editor, but it's the same thing. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm always like confused between the TV and the feature version of it, but it's this, it's similar, right? Yeah, or yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, story editor, I like again, like I would be Lauren and I would uh, have a, a session with the writer, and we'd come up with a show idea. The writer would do their version. I would sometimes give notes to the writer. Then I would take a pass before Lauren would her take her pass at the script. So mm. um, that was what that was my story editor role. And these these all these terms are like kind of flexible depending upon the. You know, the the project, but that's what I did on my little pony. Yeah. Um. What was the so? What's the biggest difference between uh writing for TV and writing a book for you? I mean, the the biggest difference is basically um, it's not collaborative. You know what I mean? It's mostly yeah. everything's up to me. Um, uh, right. I have you know now that it's picked, it's picked. I, I I kind of just did it on spec. I did it in my spare time. Um. Uh, for a few years and then when I got a version that I thought I was happy with and I'd shown it to a few people my wife's been a great um, editor and, and, and partner for mm -hmm. me and gave me a lot of input on it showed it I showed it to Alex Hirsch at one point he gave me some great notes you know mm -hmm. so it's it, I showed it to a few people along the way and got and got feedback from them um, so it's not like I haven't taken ideas or, or criticism from anybody but mostly it's been just me alone in a room sure coming mm -hmm. up yeah. with the whole thing um, and now going forward like I have I have this deal with Penguin and I have editors that I'm working with and they gave me their notes. But unlike a, a studio exec, like I don't have to do their notes. I literally, <laughs> I literally could ignore all their notes if I wanted to. They, they, the, you know, unlike, like when you, when you get a show picked up, like you think, well, now I'm in. Right. But like, it's just like, we like something about your idea. We may want to change maybe 50% of it. We may, you know, once you start working on it, we may not like most of what you do and you will have to take our notes and change things. You know what I mean? Like it's mm -hmm. not when you get a when you get a TV show and I'm guessing a movie picked up, like it doesn't mean you are now left alone to create whatever you want. You have the input of very significant people that are going to give you notes and you are going to have to find some way to navigate around those notes or do them or come to some sort of negotiated end on the whole process in the book they have given me their notes and i like their notes and i think they're 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 worthwhile and um, i'm doing most of them but i don't have to do that they bought they bought something they saw a version of it that they liked and they're like yeah this is really good and we want to make this a book here's how we think you could improve it 
but it's up to you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like we're going to mm -hmm. publish this book. It's up to you what it ends up looking like. We've been in the industry. We think we know what we're talking about. And, uh, you know, these are the things we would change, but you don't have to necessarily change them. And um, so that's been that's the biggest difference It's just the um, the creative freedom is 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 is, is bigger. Um, um, and that's been fun. It's been great to. And by the way, I've taken most of their notes. I think most of their notes have been valuable. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I'm I'm happy to take them. Um, yeah. But that's the biggest change, and it's, um, you know, it's and again, it's just me in a room, kind of uh, creating everything on my own. And um, I like both. I like collaborating with other people, and I like just kind of mm -hmm. having something that's my own. Um, you know, I could definitely see doing an animated version of this this um, trilogy when it's all when it's all done. So mm -hmm. um, there may be a collaborative version that comes to the screen, but for right now, I'm just enjoying writing it as a book. And you might know, my, mm -hmm. my 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 career is kind of tended away from being an artist and towards a writer like over the mm. trajectory of my career so it is the thing i feel most comfortable doing now um do I you feel like uh being a, a writer because i feel like this is a, a pretty common path for animators um from like your generations like starting like as animators or board artists and then slowly going towards writing yeah i mean um, yeah it, it does seem to happen um yeah i mean board artists is, so if you want your own show um, being a storyboard artist is still the best way to get there. Um, mm -hmm. um, a lot of creators I know, that's the route they take. If you're an artist, if you're not coming at it strictly from the writing end to begin with, um, you know, if you're an artist and you think you want to have your own show, get a job as a as a board artist. And um, because really all the aspects of an animated show are kind of encapsulated in that. You don't have to be the last word in the BG design. You don't have to be the last word in the character design you don't have to be the last word in the jokes you don't have to be the last word in the character dimensions but you are the first word in all those things so you get um you get a lot of practice approaching all the ends of what it takes to make an animated show and figuring out whether it's something you think you have the chops to supervise and take on mm -hmm. um and not everybody, I'm, I think it's weird because it's, <laughs> when I was at CalArts, getting your own show was such a pipe dream. It was so, it was so pie in the sky. None of us, we didn't, none of us thought we were going to have our own show, um, <laughs> you know, and, you know, most of us ended up having our own show, you know, in my, yeah. in my little group. And it was just kind of like, it was just a result of the time that we came out and the desire in the industry. But now I think a lot of kids go into it and being like, well, that's what I have to do. That's what I have to shoot show for is to have my own show. And it's not necessarily the right path for everybody. It's, um, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, um, it's, it ain't, it ain't going to make you rich unless you get really, really lucky. Uh, you know, and it not, might not, the work might not necessarily make you happy. <laughs> so, you know, it's, yeah. it's more, well, it's like a passion project. You know what I mean? It was like, I had a passion to have my own show. It was like an artistic goal. Um, and it was a creative goal, but it wasn't necessarily the career end point for, it well, obviously wasn't the career end point for me, but I don't mm -hmm. know that's the career end point for everybody or it needs to be, you know, like once you have your own show, you don't need to, well, all I can do is create my own show now ever again. Yeah. There's other ways you can be creatively fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been lucky in that I've been, you know, in the, in creative supervisory roles ever since then working with other people, helping them on their passion project and contributing a little bit of my own passion and my own ideas to it and, you know, helping make their idea better. And that's very been very satisfying for me. It still, it still scratches the same creative itch that having my own show did. Mm hmm yeah. yeah i'm glad i'm glad to hear that i think yeah. i think it's important to hear that and we've talked about it before uh, as well like it's it should not be an end goal because it's not the end and and also like everything you said and i feel like it's what i want to know is from your perspective um does it seem like it's gotten more challenging to uh create an original show or did it always feel the same level of challenge even back then um you know, I don't know. I haven't been out there pitching anything of my own. I think it is more challenging. I think Gene, you would probably have more perspective on this than I, I have do. A lot to say about uh, it, but, but yeah, I want to hear what your yeah your thoughts. Uh, but you know, like I haven't gone out and tried to pitch another show to anybody since I had my own show. I think everybody thought mm -hmm. I would, but I just didn't. I didn't want to do it back then, and, I, and I'm, um, my career just hasn't gone that way. I mean, yeah, 
this the book that I'm working on, The Horrible Bag, is like the first new creative thing of my own that I've tried tackling. It's not there's been other projects along the way, but they haven't seen the light of day. Like I I did have another I had a I had a fantasy show while I was doing Teenage Robot, and the reason it was a fantasy show was because thinking about it, I'd be like the show would be so much easier than Teenage Robot, uh, you know, oh. <laughs> and, you know, I briefly showed that to a couple of people, but it didn't go anywhere. And I was like, hey, you know what, I, you know, maybe it could be a children's book. And I tried it as a children's book. Uh, you know, uh, I've been trying to get in, do like in the publishing industry for a long time. Um, so I've been creatively working on stuff, but none of it has really seen the light of day until Horrible Back came along. Um, but um, I don't know what it's like to pitch a show. You know what I mean? I think uh having a track record certainly helps and that's tough because when you don't have a track record you know right. the, that's why I, I really do think the shorts programs are the best way to find um new talent and new ideas even from veterans like i think it, i think it behooves anybody to um have to prove their idea in in in, mm. a, in, in, a, in a pilot um even you know the most the most seasoned veterans um because once you start working on it it's going to be different than what you think it's going to be um um, but yeah, I don't, you know, there, there's certainly, there are more places, there's a lot, there's other places to pitch now, and there's certainly a hunger for ideas out there, but, um, I don't feel like there's the creative freedom or the, yeah, the well, vote of confidence necessarily given it's to a lot of, creators. A lot of IP stuff, you know, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's just, is, that's yeah. just, just swallowing so much space like that's out there, you know, it really is. the, the emphasis on existing IP is just, it's. But, you know, this stuff comes in waves. It was just the same. It was the same when I was growing up in the 80s. You know what I mean? There weren't. I was going to ask about that. There weren't, yeah. there weren't a I, lot of original new ideas on the air. It was all. You know, well, Lauren Faust said, and I want to ask her this, too, if we get her on the show. But like she had tweeted something about that, that it's like the industry is going into a, a very similar state that it was in in the 80s, maybe worse. And where everything is IP driven, everything is all about pushing like product. And, and that's scary. Like that's a scary thing to hear uh, because it's like, that was not a great time. And obviously everybody that grew up with that stuff, you know, kid, kids growing up with that stuff, they didn't even see it that way. It was just, no, of course not. Yeah. They, they, yeah. they enjoyed it. And I mean, yeah, you know, my, my, I was too old to buy into all that stuff. My, I, I, I lived, I lived in the real desert of the seventies, which was, you know, I was a, I was kind of cartoon watching age in the seventies. I kept watching them because I love them. But like for me, it was just it was like I was watching I was watching old theatrical stuff shown on TV. I was watching all the old Fleischer Popeye cartoons, which were my favorites, and the sure. old Warner Brothers stuff, and even the old sixties and seventies Hanna Barbera shows were were fun. And that's that's what I saw was all that early early stuff. Um, um, so like there was nothing, you know, there was Saturday morning was just like lots of Scooby-Doo and other mm -hmm. forgettable stuff, other forgettable Hanna-Barbera stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it was really not until, you know, things kind of started turning around in the 90s and, and, and you know, they were allowing us to make new stuff again that, that things changed. But, you know, everything comes in waves and this, this wave will exhaust itself, I hope, as well. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's ever going to be a time <laughs> in my life where there won't be another Batman movie coming out. You know, no, like yeah. uh, there's we're no, on this know, train. You know, it's yeah, just going to keep going. And, and and that's fine. And I know there's there are people compare like, well, you know, yeah. these are our Greek myths, and that's why we keep retelling them yeah. to ourselves and whatever. And that's a cool way to look at it. And I don't mind that. I just you know, it'd be nice to see new stuff coming out as well. And it would be nice. You know, I, I, all, all like it takes is noise. you know, all it takes is one one new thing that someone mm -hmm. takes a gamble on to become a huge hit and then everybody's going to be looking for new ideas again yeah. you know what i mean and right it'll mm -hmm. it'll happen you know it's who knows when but it'll happen it's, it's these things all they all happen in waves which is you know it's no comfort to someone who's out there now trying you know today in the middle of ip mania trying to pitch a new idea <laughs> ip mania you know it's, <laughs> yeah um but you know eventually the, the 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 worm will turn and things will change and um yeah. but you know it's 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 an interesting place to be there's just so much out there now there's so much and <laughs> there's so much entertainment and television and it's, it's that's it's, the thing it's right yeah, it's, it, there's 
there's so many avenues and it's a shame and it, it felt like there was this bubble of like original ideas and then as always like money leads the way and so it, everything kind of collapsed into the safe bets because yeah it, well it because the, the execs that make these choices are betting with their career right like this right you know yep. they're, mm -hmm. every, yep. they're betting that they Absolutely. don't want to get fired they want to continue to be employed so you know yeah. what's 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 going what's a better bet a new iteration of batman or you know something that somebody's never seen before i mean mm -hmm. you know yeah. that's what no, that's what it's, 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 it's 100% true yeah yeah so it's i mean it's uh, good it's good to give the give creators to give them the opportunity to take us you know do a small gamble like do a pilot or whatever and right. you know if it makes if it makes you laugh and makes all the people around you laugh then they're, they're, they're or makes you cry or whatever it's trying to do then it's worth pursuing you know what i mean like but you don't have to spend yeah. you don't have to gamble on a whole series to get a new idea out of somebody i mean god right. knows god knows artists are desperate enough to almost take any deal you offer them to get their idea totally. up on the yeah. up, up on the yeah. screen so yeah you know yeah, yeah. very true yeah i i had to like take a step back from from uh all of that stuff because it was i, I actually have been working with fred a little bit in the last year and like um I mean, he said the same thing. He's just like, it's just, it's all IP out there. And like, it's really hard to do originals. And yeah. like, we're, we're still working on some projects, but um, even if Fred Siebert says that, <laughs> like if Fred feels like it, it's really hard to get something original made, that means things are pretty sour, you know? Yeah. I feel like for, but for like, you know, people like, like, like uh, your eye, uh, Gene, who haven't, run a show yet or whatever and like we're like it's still valuable for us to pitch original ideas even if it might not get made because then it's like getting what we're all about out there right like i don't know that's kind of sure. how i look at it it's like well this is it's the like kind a networking of, opportunity you know yeah it's like that's the kind of content i'm interested in making like you know are you more like like interested in like serialized drama or like are you more of like a comedy person yeah. or like you know kind of it's an advertisement too yeah, yeah. I, I, I see what you're saying yeah. I needed to recharge and I, I, yeah, I never <laughs> yeah. stop. The thing is, it's like, I never stopped making uh, th for us, this podcast for me, at least I shouldn't speak for V, but for me, this <laughs> podcast was a way to like m take a step back, but still be engaged because it's like after Planet Panic didn't get picked up, it was like, that was devastating. And it was really, you know, a hard few months, but like getting back into it in this way and like trying to pay it forward a little bit and using our connections and using our resources to just like help, build up a foundation for maybe the next wave is is helping and um yeah. it, i don't know it's it's been good and then we get people like you and it's great it's like we get we get people who have been around for a while who can impart some wisdom who can give perspective which is really mm -hmm. important yeah um it's huge it's it's um i'm hoping that people get something out of our silly little show um, <laughs> speaking speaking of the people uh mm -hmm. we have uh, a few twitter questions i wanted to ask you sure um from at mallard art um what are the difficulties when pitching a show with a female protagonist that's mainly action focused was there a lot of hesitation from executives being scared there won't be a target audience for it um i don't know i don't know if there were those questions or not um you know uh I'll try and again. I, I tend to lapse into stories of my own career when I when I get these questions. But I never pitched. I never pitched Teenage Robot. I never pitched it as a show. This is the weird thing that happened, which is oh, okay. I pitched. I I, uh, I did the pilot. Um, it was well thought of at Nickelodeon. Um, there was talk that like it could be a show, um, but Fred Zybert again. Uh, I was I was ready. I was kind of done. I'd been at uh, Nick for three years and done a bunch of pilots and Teenage Robot was the last thing I did. Um, and I was ready to move on. And Fred said, like, you know, go go wherever you want to go. If they want to do a show with your with your idea, they'll get you back. <laughs> you don't have to sit around in Nickelodeon working on projects you don't Dude, want. Dude, I made that mistake. On. Yeah, <laughs> I wish I had known that. Yeah. So like I left. That's when I went to Family Guy. I went to Family Guy and um, while I was a family guy, there was one exec at Nick who was really hot on my show. She asked, asked me to do like a mini pilot. I, I mean, I'm not a mini pilot, mini Bible. And I did this kind of like, you know, like five, six page Bible. It was very bare bones. It just kind of get, laid out the basics of the, what I thought the show would be like. And I sent to her or that to her and she really liked it. And she thought, this is great. And then that exec left Nickelodeon. And I thought, well, that's the end of that. And then she, the, yeah. my one champion, Nickelodeon, has gone. 
And like three years went by. I didn't, I left in 99 and I heard from Fred about my show again in 2002. <laughs> and mm -hmm. he said, you know, Fairly Odd Parents has come out. It's a huge success. They're looking back at the shorts we made to see if there's other shows there. They think yours could be a show. You know, you may get a call from them. And this was at the end of the year. And I'm like, they're not going to make a decision during the holidays. They never make any decisions during the holidays. And then I got a call from a Nickelodeon exec saying, we want to pick up your show. Uh, and they did. And, uh, you know, I never went to a meeting and pitched the idea. I never had to, I never had to justify, you know, a female lead in an action show. I just did. That's it. awesome though. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's, um, that's you know, good. The, the, the problem came when it came to marketing, because I thought like, mm. I thought like in, in merchandising, which was like, I thought it was a natural, like I was like, it's transformers for girls. And I thought that's mm -hmm. amazing. That's going to be, that's, that's my way into merchandising heaven. You know what I mean? Like, um, but no, and I didn't really realize until I worked on My Little Pony with Lauren Faust, but that like toy stores are very gender segregated. There are, yeah, there are. are boys aisles and there are girls aisles. And if they don't know where your product goes, you ain't going to yeah. get any product. You're not going to, there is Pink no transformers blue. for girls. You know, there's yeah. transformers and then there's girls. <laughs> so like I had mm -hmm. this female transforming robot and like no, no toy, no, nobody in toys wanted to touch that. Um, you know, so, you know, whether that was an hindrance to it gone in terms of a show, I, I never really felt that, but it, it, it never got, it never took off in terms of merchandising. It, the ratings weren't good enough and, and nobody could, nobody knew where to put it in terms of um, the, the toy store. So, mm. yeah, that's so disappointing. I, and I know that that's a thing. And like, I wonder if um, people that aren't in, in the industry fully know that, like how much of um marketing relies on toy sales and how mu and how hard it is to push anything through and and like unfortunately it seems like still that market is divided pretty evenly like yeah. even though you know gender roles have been being questioned and everything uh toys it's still like it's still boys and girls because a lot of people are still raising their kids one way or the other you yeah. know so it's like yeah it's still it's still really I mean, hard. My my, uh. my my show was kind of trying to fight against that idea of these the, the gender stereotypes that like people assume are true. I don't I don't I don't think any of those are true. I, I totally think, mm -hmm. you know, I think it, like it's all about how you raise a kid and like, you know, of course, yeah, there's no gender that has a, you know, has a, um, a monopoly on certain emotions or certain characteristics. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know, I don't believe any of that. And that's part of what the show was about. You know, it was part about showing. Yeah. I mean, I've always enjoyed, um, you know, I've, I enjoy female protagonists. I just think they're, they can be, sure. they're, they're interesting in a way that boy protagonists, especially in an action show, um, can be. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I was uh, excited to do it. And so, you know, I made the show I wanted to make and I didn't really think about the, the consequences in terms of um, the ancillary stuff because um, yeah. it became pretty clear it wasn't going to happen. So, Well, you, you shouldn't, right? And that's yeah. something that like, you shouldn't have to think about the marketing and how it's going to happen because like that's somebody else's job, right? Exactly. So like, yeah. You got to focus on just making a good show. And and the legacy of the show is like, it's, it's crazy. Like I, if people still love it. Like I see it everywhere online all the time. Like it, I think that it uh, really like stood the test of time, which is great. Like it, it holds up. Yeah. I mean, it's very, um, very gratifying for me to see that there's a lot of love out there still, still for the show. Yeah. So it means a lot to me that yeah. it hasn't disappeared down the memory hole because there's a, not at all. There's a, yeah. there's a lot of competition with people's attention. So that <laughs> anybody's paying any attention to it is a huge, uh, a huge um, uh, source of joy for me. Yeah, no, it, no, it has definitely endured. It's, it's, it's really cool. Um, uh, at, Shavishian one uh, asked, uh, since you're working with Alex Hirsch on an adult animated show, uh, how is the feeling of doing adult driven animation after doing family friendly animation for almost three decades? Um, I mean, like I said, the only other experience I had an adult was was Family Guy, and that was that was very different. But this this experience has not been very different. I um, mean, that it's um because of where Alex's concerns are and my concerns are, which are that any show is about the characters. Um, you know, uh, their, their emotional journey, um, who they are, what they think about the other characters around them, how they all relate to each other, what their relationships are, whether you get to use, you know, drop F-bombs or not. To me, like, that's not the, uh, that's not the most exciting thing about adult 
right. you know, yeah. like pushing some of the more like the more like dang, the, the idea of danger, real danger, real death, that kind of touching on that stuff is more exciting. But mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think the basic storytelling should be any different. Um, you know, I think a lot of uh, I mean, I think the reason The Simpsons is still on the air and God knows I haven't watched it in a very, very long time, but is that those characters are just so they're so beloved and they're beloved for a reason because they've they've had so many years to breathe and to and to evolve and be and to be something special and the idea that like it's you know you know it's not i can't think of any other show adult or you know a kid that has the breadth that that show has and i don't really think it has anything to do with the fact that they can touch on adult subjects but i think that's certainly it's certainly helpful to grab maybe older the older demographic but I feel it's just like the strength of the storytelling and the sense of humor and 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 the and the just the um, the the largeness of the world and I think that's what Alex is going to strive for in his show and you know the fact that we can have the characters um, you know talk about sex or, or or say swear words or whatever I don't know that that's necessarily it's nice to have that freedom but I don't think it's really central to anything so for me it hasn't for me it hasn't really been very it hasn't been very different. Um, it's mm-hmm. you know it's still about the characters and 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 their relationship with each other and their relationship to the wider world out there and what what that world is that they exist in and how it's different from our own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, from at Malkman is here. How do you feel about the concept of YA animation as proposed by Kipo creator Rad Seacrest? Do you believe there's a future for it? Um, I, I have to admit I'm not familiar with that concept. Is it, it, um, um I guess it means like um. Animation that is trying to hit the demographic of like preteen to teenager, you know, it's yeah. it's the mm-hmm. same as the YA books. I know, see. It's, okay. It's like yeah. Kind of I mean, like if it was like yeah, like could be Buffy or like Twilight or like yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, else. look, I love animation. I've worked mm-hmm. in it for close right. to thirty years. <laughs> I've, no shit. I, I don't think it's reserved to any one good demographic. You know, I mean, I think, I think it's an amazing art form and it's it's relegated to the ghettos in this uh country to a certain extent still and it shouldn't be um so yeah of course there should be why animation there should be animation for all ages i mean i'd love to see those kind of stories being told and being embraced i mean i mean think anime does that already right i mean anime is yeah so much to teach western animation in terms of like the breadth and the, the variety of the stories they tell and the the, the age ranges that they they are marketing to and and, and targeting um and I only know very little of that of that that stuff but to me it's it's like it's it's just so interesting to see what you can do in Japanese animation that would never fly in a, in a in, in American animation you know it's just it's like they're to get to do so many different things I mean you know uh, hopefully animation will continue to evolve and and we'll be able to tell those kind of stories um uh and um you know i don't know i you know look look i i, I used to think i had a, a good handle on what the world is but the the past four years have taught me that i don't know yeah. don't know don't know much about what the actual world is anymore yeah, so yeah. to make predictions of the future on any subject i i, I tend to shy away from them i hope that there's a, a future with why anime why animation i hope there's you know a broader yeah. bigger greater future for animation as a whole like um, it's a joy to discover a new animated um, show that that you love and that you uh, that just does something different than you've seen ever seen before, mm-hmm. um, because so many shows don't do that and so many live action shows don't do that. And the idea that like it's, you know you know again IP mania and, and endlessly uh, the snake endlessly swallowing its own tail it's, it's mm-hmm. just it's boring. Um, so I tend to sh- uh, I tend to seek out things that aren't aren't the same thing that aren't boring um you know in in whatever genre i'm I'm looking to looking to enjoy um i agree it's one of the reasons i love horror because i think horror though of course we have our ips in horror and we go back to them again and again and again there's just a there's such a um there's an ability to bend things in horror and um that you don't necessarily get in other genres so it's why i'm a, mm. a, a huge horror fan and and and, and consume a lot of it <laughs> there's yeah. been a huge like resurgence of indie horror too like in the last yeah. like 10 years it's like crazy how much good stuff has been coming yeah out, like, arts yeah. And stuff yeah i think it's just like it's just i agree and i feel like it hasn't been explored as much uh 
like in popular culture like obviously there's like this slasher movies and stuff that are like very specific but i feel like yeah, when you look like... at like in anime and you see like for example junji ito where it's more like existential yeah. horror mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. fun because yeah. it hasn't been done that much except like maybe in like literary fiction and yes. it's really cool to see it come into the mainstream I yeah think. i mean his stuff specifically i just discovered him a few years ago and i just am so bowled over by everything he does yeah. And so like, too. I mean, you got, you turn, you're what you're reading one of his comics and you turn the page and you're just like, you're, you have two reactions at the same time. You're like shocked. And then your mind is also going, of course, of course, that's yeah. what he, of course. That, yes. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course. There's going to be great white sharks like attacking people on land. How, oh, the, man. Of course. That's where this was all leading Gyo, to. Why yeah. Would, why Gyo would... is, is a ridiculous. It is. Yeah. <laughs> have you, um, have you read, oh, what is it called? Uh, Ramina where it's like the planet is getting closer. Oh no. To I Earth. missed that one. So I, it, it talk about like, where is this going? Like, cause it's, it's like, there is a planet, an alien planet moving towards Earth, and uh, a scientist finds it, names it the same name as his daughter, uh -huh. and uh, and it just keeps getting closer. And it's like, wherever you think that story would go, it goes further. Like, yeah. it's just like- He always goes crazy. further, right? It's he always so goes fun. further, yeah. but at the same time, you're like, of course that's gonna, what's gonna happen. Yes, of course right. that's the image you're gonna show me. Like, he's, uh, he just does, you know, such a great job of doing yeah. what he does uh yeah you know and like it's not something i mean look there's regardless yes it's horrible that there's all this ip glutting our our media landscape but the landscape is so large and there's so many weird things out there that were created last week or a hundred years ago that no but you know that you don't know about as an individual and like there's the world is so the world of media and entertainment and books and tv and movies it's so huge you can you can avoid the IP for the rest of your life if you want to, and still have a Absolutely. very very fruitful, interesting Definitely. like uh, media life. Uh, you know all the stuff that you can discover. Um, um, you know that's out there. Um, you know, and uh, you know, like I didn't become rich off my show. <laughs> I didn't. Right. They'll go on to have five other shows written by Rob, written and created by Rob Renzetti afterwards. But like we talked about a few minutes ago, like people are still discovering my show and people yeah. are still enjoying it. And yeah. you know, like I don't get a financial benefit from someone's fan image of Jenny, but I get an emotional mm -hmm. benefit from it. Uh, you know, just watching you guys, sketch sketch jenny while we were talking gives yeah, me a yeah, lot yeah. of joy i wish i could have joined you but i could barely <laughs> get the thing to work the one That's image right. i did of jenny looks like she's looking upset at she's your guys upset. drawings but i was wanted i wanted to draw dexter talking next to her and she's like she's like i do not need another mad scientist in my life but i couldn't, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't get the, the program to let me draw dexter but you know so like yeah not there's allowed. there's so much stuff out there it's it's um you know, it's so much great stuff to discover. Um, uh, so I have um, I have optimism towards the future in that I know whatever happens in the world, if I need to escape, there's something new waiting around the next bend that I can escape with that I've I have never seen before. Yeah, that's great. Um, what uh, goals do you have for the future for your career and maybe life in general? <laughs> uh, well, let's let's get this pandemic truly ended. That's a good good yeah. goal. Um, but, like you were just saying, it's hard to predict anything. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, I you can. Um, I keep my nose to the grindstone and pretty close to my own home. But like my yeah, my my goals right now are like I'm pouring all my creative energy into this into this trilogy of books. Uh, um, um, the horrible bag of terrible things. That's the first one. But there's going to be two more um, I, that may I may do some sort of, you know, movie or TV version of that. Those are my immediate creative goals is this, this property, but uh -huh. long-term I'm probably, you know, even when I retire from animation, I want to keep writing. So I'm hoping to have like, just become a full-time author eventually. Um, uh, yeah. And, uh, but you know, as, in terms of like animation projects for me, it's always like, what's the most interesting in terms of the people and, and the idea. And um, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky in that I'm sought after and um, you know, I, I don't have to worry about I'm being unemployed for long stretches of time um, because, you know, someone's someone's usually looking for my input. So 
Um, I'm very lucky. I don't, you know, beyond what I'm working on right now, I don't know if Alex's thing will go forward into production or if, you know, uh, Craig is working on some new ideas for Netflix. He may get something else up and running there or he may do something somewhere else. Um, you know, uh, there's other opportunities out there, but I've, I've never had to really think too far ahead in that degree. Usually something interesting comes along. Um, so, you know, my goals are basically just to help to stay creatively active in one way or another. Um, it's one of the reasons I tried to launch this author career because, you know, it's as a, as a doddering old 70 year old, I should still be able to type on a screen um, and um, wherever <laughs> I'm living, create, create new books. Uh, You'll just be able to think thoughts and they'll appear on screen. Probably yeah. at that point, right? Let's, yeah. maybe. You can already dictate your books to That's like, Google Docs and stuff. Yeah it's, yeah, yeah, it's scary how much which was so remote sci-fi when I was a kid is now our reality. It's uh, yeah, it's an amazing progress in that, in yeah, that regard. It's, it's, it's good to take stock of that stuff every once in a while because the progress is slow, but then you look around and you're like, we have video phones. Like, I remember that being like yeah science that was fiction. that was dick tracy on his television wristwatch and like yeah some but the thing is though like like that led somebody to think like well what if we actually tried to do that and then they did it you know eventually right. it got done mm -hmm. whether it was a yeah. chain of like 10 people that had to pass that idea from one to the next but like that's the amazing thing. like <clears throat> there's so much there's reasons to be optimistic and tons of reasons to be pessimistic and i kind of go between them like i almost feel like um we're not necessarily worthy as a race of the technology we've created <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> you know absolutely. sometimes yeah. like you know it's hard to know uh, you know if we really are ready to use it as 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 best as best it could be used but you know, hopefully the best among us can maybe save the worst among us from ourselves. Yeah. Well, that's, that's always been the case, right? Like that's right. always been, it's, there's always a, a um, majority of people that can't handle whatever new thing is happening. But then thankfully there's always that minority that is like, all right, you know, put the, put the toys down kids. We gotta get, we gotta actually get to work here. Yeah. Um, but we'll figure it out. Let's end on a positive note. We'll figure sure. it out. Sure. Let's hope we figure it out. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's the end of this creative block. Rob, thanks so much for being our guest and sharing your story. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, talking with you guys. Thanks so much. Of course. And thanks to your listeners. Follow us on Twitter. It's at Creative Block, Creative Without the Vowels, where we ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask our guests. Huge thanks to our editor, Clements, for editing the podcast and Malik for helping us produce the show. If you love our show, then support us on Patreon. Becoming a patron gets you early access to interviews as well as bonus episodes. Click the link in the description of this episode. I've been your host, Gene. And I was V. Keep being creative, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.